free chicken I am not, but I was born in the year of the rooster, uh, so it is perhaps appropriate that I, I'm here to, to, to give the first rooster talk. Uh, and that first rooster talk is on putting purpose at the heart of strategy. But before I go into, into the talk, just a, a little bit about us. This is our mission statement. Um, we bring know-how to help clients grow, and particularly uh, clients that want to grow fast. Uh, and our clients tell us that they value us as critical friends um, because we listen without judging, um, we offer insight and guidance, um, we hold our clients to account, um, and we equip them to lead and grow their businesses. I might pause for a croissant in a moment. <laughs> um, so we, we, we often, when we're working with our clients, we like to use a visual tool set, and we, we, we make a lot of use of this. Have, have people come across this, visual leaders? David Sibbett. So this is published quite a while ago. There are two or three in this series, um, and he has, a, he has a consultancy in California called Grove Consulting. Um, and this is a, a, a visual tool set um, based or, around the work that, that Sibbett's done. Um, we like these because they're very good at getting teams together around um, the, the, the challenges that our, our clients typically are facing. And we like this one in particular because it puts purpose right at the heart of what is actually a strategy template. So you all thought this was thrown together this morning, but there's a template that we use that has purpose at the heart of strategy. So why purpose? I'm gonna use the word why a lot this morning. I realized when I've been going through this, I keep, I, I keep saying, why is purpose, but purpose is why. So here's the definition, the reason for which something is done, that's why, isn't it? Um, or created or for which something exists. Now I, I've heard a lot of people talk about purpose and mission in the same breath. So um, almost, almost uh, suggesting that they're the same things. I, I don't think that purpose and mission are the same. Uh, and hopefully by the end of this, you'll, you'll understand why, why again. Um, just to illustrate how powerful purpose can be, I'm going to show a short video. Now, are there, are there non-sports fans in the room, and particularly people who don't like boxing? That's fine. The, the message is more important than what's going to be coming on the, uh, on the action, but um, have a look at this. You can write everything down if you want to. Be brave enough to write every one of your goals down, but I'm gonna tell you something. Life's gonna hit you in your mouth and you gotta do me a huge favor. Your why has to be greater than that knockdown. And I love it. Buster Douglas got knocked out. Nobody ever got knocked out by Mike Tyson and ever got back up. It was almost a 10 count. I, he was stumbling. They were four, three, two, he, one. And ding, 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 saved by the bell. He goes to his corner. The whole world is like, yep, that's it. Once he comes back out, that's it. Mike's going to just hammer him. And exactly that, Mike Tyson came out like, I got him. I got this kid up against the rope. Listen to me, many of you right now, life's got you up against the rope. You can't give up. You can't give in. Listen to me, if it was easy, everybody would do it. And if life's got you backed up, I need you to do what Buster Douglas did. Buster Douglas start fighting back. The world was shocked. <gasps> Goliath has been knocked down. What happened? And they went to Buster Douglas and they asked Buster Douglas simply like, what happened? And Buster Douglas said, listen to me, it's real simple. Before my mother died, she told the whole world that I was going to beat Mike Tyson. And two days before the fight, my mother died. Buster Douglas had, he had a decision to make. When his mother died, he could die with his mother or he made a decision, I can wake up and I can live for mom. And he knocked Mike Tyson out simply because his why was greater than that punch. His why was greater than defeat. His why was greater than his trial and his tribulation. And I'm telling you, if you don't know what your why is and your why isn't strong, you're gonna get knocked out every single day. Powerful stuff, right? And 
Now, I'm not suggesting that you need to take a punch every day uh, and you need to have a strong why to be able to get up from that. Um, but, but there is no doubt from the, the research and the work that we've done that if you've got a strong purpose, it, it gives you something more. Um, so I, I want to dip into a little bit of academic research, show you a couple of things to try and explain this, um, look at, at some purpose in practice, give you some examples of what good purpose statements might look like, uh, including ours. And you can comment on whether you think it's good or not. Um, and then also talk about purpose at a personal level, um, which I think is what makes purpose um, really different. So uh, how many of you uh, are familiar with this? This is Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Okay, so the, the principle is, is I, I think, quite well recognized. Um, as human beings, we need first to have uh, uh, food and water, and then we need security. And then once we've got security, we can start thinking about partnerships and relationships and family, perhaps, um, and then recognition, and then beyond that, um, what Maslow calls self-actualization. So achieving our full potential, being the best that we can be. Now, if people in here have employees, you might recognize that this is why money is not considered to be a motivator. Money is a demotivator. If you haven't got enough, you want more. But if you have got enough, then actually being paid more doesn't necessarily get the result that you as their employee wants from them. Does that resonate with people? Do people understand that, 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 that concept? Okay, so Maslow is not the only academic out here. We have this chap, Viktor Frankl. Um, he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And in it, he says, what man actually needs is not a tensionless state, but rather a striving and struggling for a worthwhile goal. Being human always points and is directed to something or someone. The more one forgets himself, the more human he is, and the more he actualizes himself. So that word actualizing again. So essentially saying that it's not about gaining pleasure or avoiding pain, it's actually about finding some sort of meaning in our lives. So sport alert, um, the All Blacks, the All Blacks, individual All Blacks always talk about um, having the shirt just for a temporary basis. So Mc Richard McCall's current captain, he wears number seven. So he wears number seven whilst he's in the team, but his objective is to leave that position in a better place for the next person who comes in uh, uh, in that position. And, and that, to me, um, aligns with the, the idea that as directors or owners of a business, our responsibility is actually to leave that business in a better place when we leave it than, than when we started it. Businesses outlive us all, or should outlive us all. So as a director in it, your, your purpose is, or one of your, your objectives, is to, is to take it to a better place. Um, this book is a very good book if you haven't read it, Legacy by James Carr, or James Kerr, I don't know how to pronounce that. It's not a book about rugby, it's a book about leadership and purpose. Uh, and there's a chapter called Purpose in it, and I just want to read a quote from that. Um, our fundamental human drive comes from within, from intrinsic rather than extrinsic motivations. Leaders who harness the power of purpose have the ability to galvanize a group. It begins, be, begins by asking, why are we doing this? The answer has the ability to transform the fortunes of a group or an enterprise. And I think um, this book was charts the, the uh, um, progress that the All Blacks made from a disastrous Tri-Nations tournament where they finished last to winning two World Cups in a row. Um, and it's pretty inspirational. I'd recommend anybody to read it. Simon Sinek, people have heard of him. There's a famous TEDx talk on YouTube. He wrote a book called Start With Why. Um, most people know what they do, but very few people know why they do it. And he has the magic circle. Um, I'll see it from here. Yeah. The what, why, and how, so people know what they do. They, they usually know how they're going to do it, but why they actually do it makes a big makes a big difference. And um, as a customer or potential client of your services, if I know why you do what you do, I'm much more likely to engage with you and purchase whatever it is that you're offering. <coughs> So again, the video's worth having a look at if you haven't seen it. Um, Branson's interested in this space too. 
he says it's always been his objective to create businesses with a defined purpose beyond making money. Um, did you know in the UK you can't set up a business and define its purpose as making money? You're not allowed to do that. It's a, money's a result. So you define your purpose as doing something and you make money as a result of that. Uh, Branson's now involved in, in um, something called the Plan B. Um, they're developing what, what he calls a blueprint for better business, um, which is about creating businesses whose prime objective is, is benefit for people and the planet. So beyond, um, beyond profit. Now, why is it? Why? Why is it that suddenly everybody seems to be talking about purpose? Because I remember when I started out working in the 70s and 80s, people had vision and mission, yes, but, but the concept of purpose and why you actually did what you did didn't really seem to come up in any of the, the, the conversations or strategy conversations that I got involved in through my career. It seems only to have been in the last, I don't know, 10 years, maybe five years, that, that purpose has become something that people talk about. I, the Sinek book can't be much, much longer than that ago. So there is a, another guy, this chap, Frederick Lalu, this book, Reinventing Organizations. Now, I'm a bit, of a, a bit of a nerd. I think this is the best book on organizational design I've ever, I've ever written, uh, ever read, read rather. Um, but he, he's working with a theory that as our society evolves, so the way we organize and collaborate evolves. And I think here's where the, where the, where the, the, the rationale for purpose is, is, is coming from. So he, he has this, can't put a PowerPoint together without playing with a bit of clip art. Um, but he, he documents in there a sort of history of the evolution of, of organization. So if you go back to when we first as a, as a race or as a species started to organize, they would have been under chiefdoms. Um, so they would have been really commanding control. You do as you're told or you get killed, essentially. And if, if you're leading a, a, a team out to trap a dinosaur or something like that to, to eat, then you know, pretty much you've got, to do, you've got to do that. But as we got a bit more sophisticated, as the Industrial Revolution came along, we started to organize bigger, bigger companies. They became bureaucracies. Now, today, bureaucracy has a has a sort of little negative um, association with being drowned in, in red tape. But in, when, they, when they first came out, bureau, bureaucracy was about quality, about getting things right. Um, so amber was his color code for bureaucracy. Um, in the 70s, 80s, um, you had companies that were meritocracies. So in other words, it was uh, the management by performance, up or out was the, the general principle. Um, consultancies, um, law practices, big accounting firms were, were meritocracies. Um, green companies, all about empowerment. Um, John Lewis is a little bit like this, so it, it kind of butts the, butts the um, trend a little bit because they're, they're such an old company. But they, they're about empowering their um, employees, but still in a, in, a, in, a, in a hierarchy, in a pyramid. Um, more recently, you've got the rise of eco-friendly businesses and bu businesses that are trying to generate engagement in their workforce through involvement in CSR projects, corporate social responsibility type projects. But the breakthrough, according to, to Lalu, um, is what he calls, what he color codes, teal, teal businesses. Um, and these are self-management, these are self-managed businesses um, that are... Uh, united around a higher, what he calls a higher purpose. It doesn't often define what that higher purpose is, but it's a higher purpose that drives these businesses. And if you're self-managed, so you have no hierarchy at all, then you need something to, com to, to, to get your workforce, or the workforce needs something that it, c it can get behind. And that higher purpose is, is, uh, is, is what he says. So he, he talks about a sense that the way we manage today is out of date. He talks about a longing for soulful work for workplaces, authenticity, community, passion, and purpose. And there are quite a few companies around that are, that are following this. This is Valve. Anybody heard of Valve? They're a US um, gaming applications developer, developer based in Washington State, I think. Uh, and this is off their homepage. So they've been proudly 
boss free since 1996. Um, in their work, in their in their office, every every employee in their office has um, uh, a desk and chairs on wheels, so they can move around wherever they want to move in the in in their office and join whatever team they want to join, and it's entirely their responsibility to do that. It's a pretty cool place to work. Can you imagine bringing? You know, cool, cool guys together, creative guys together to to build games. Um, I'm not a gamer particularly, but they they build, I think, some quite innovative stuff, and just letting them get on with it. So there's there's no direction, nobody's in charge, and they're not the only one. All of these companies, Favia, a French automotive engineer, Patagonia are um, outdoor clothing, Sun Hydraulics are a U.S. engineering company, Burtzorg are a Dutch neighborhood nursing organization. So in each neighborhood, there are teams of nurses that are completely self-managed to deliver uh, with, with the purpose of delivering the best possible service to their, their patients. Morning Star are an American tomato processing business. At the height of the season, they have two and a half thousand employees. No management, no managers. It's pretty good, isn't it? Double, the guys in the middle, um, they're actually based in Bristol, double retail. Um, and Matt Tipping, um, their creative director, he came to a, a roundtable on innovation we ran a couple of weeks, a, a couple of months ago, back in February, um, and he says this, or during the course of the conversation, he said, "I had a bit of an epiphany. If you employ somebody, why don't you trust them?" So this book, well, he, the, one, one of the, 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 the main principles in this book is if you if you employ somebody, you should trust them. Does that sounds pretty logical, doesn't it? But how many here have worked in companies where they felt that they haven't been trusted? I know I have. Oh, that's pretty, pretty unpleasant, actually. Anyway, he goes on to say, so we changed the business. All business decisions are completely transparent. Everybody knows pretty much everything that's going on. The way that we run innovation, anybody can come up with an idea, and they, and they form a team of like-minded people who want to take that idea forward. No one can say no. They work with that idea, then they come back and pitch it to the whole business. And if you fundamentally can't prove why it'll fail or why or, or be damaging to the business, it goes forward. It's all about responsibility to each other. Effectively, we only have one rule. If we commit to a deadline to each other or the client or the supplier, we always hit it. That's their one rule. Now they they've been growing really fast, double over the last last two or three years since they, they made that change. I've put Valve up there again. You can actually download Valve's employee handbook from their website if you can find it. Sorry, I'm in the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you go like this. Um, and it, and it's, it's really an interesting read. Um, in it, they say, we want innovators. And that means maintaining an environment where they will flourish. That's why Valve is flat. It's our way of saying that we don't have any management and nobody reports to anybody else. We do have a founder president, but even he isn't your manager. This company is yours to steer towards opportunities and away from risks. If you're thinking to yourself, wow, that sounds like a lot of responsibility, you're right. And that's why hiring is the single most important thing you will do at Valve. Anytime you interview, you need to ask yourself if they're capable of literally running the business because they will be. I find that quite astonishing that that is in an employee handbook. I'd like to work in this company, although I'm not probably not creative enough for them. Um, now, what, what's interesting about this is they talk about not having any management. That's not strictly true. They don't have any managers, but they do have management, because how else could you run a company? So Teal companies, and again, this is from Lalu's book, Teal companies have a set of policies and practices, the way we work here, call it a constitution, perhaps, which documents how pay rises are awarded, how... Um, performance is managed, particularly bad performance, how um, new employees are taken on, how decisions are taken. So there's no, it's not true to say that there's no management, just that there are no managers. You know, is that, yeah? But, but all of those policies are written by all the employees. So they're motivated to follow exactly what's in those policies because they wrote them. And nobody's then telling them what to do beyond that. They're telling themselves how, how to run the business. So when they say here, you need to ask yourself if they're capable of literally running the business because they will be, that's exactly what they mean. They will be running the business. 
So if there's a change to any of those policies, all the employees come together and they make those changes. Now, I think that's quite exciting. Does anybody, anybody like to work in a company like that? I, said, I, I definitely would. So all of this is possible because these companies have a shared purpose, that purpose that is driving them forward. I'm going to show you in a moment some, some purpose statements. Um, I'm going to show you those now, I think. Oh, no. Um, so we think, before I show you those purpose statements, we think that when purpose is embedded in your DNA, it can su sustain um, you through higher growth and all the challenges that you get in higher growth. This company, The House, has anybody heard of them? Based in Bath, branding, branding agency. Um, so they talk about building valuable businesses on purpose. So they launched their, their stuff on purpose a while ago. And they're quite interesting. If you want to go and read some of the stuff, that Steve Fuller is one of the directors there. Uh, he puts some, some quite interesting blogs out. So if you want to read more on this and, and, and find out from a company that's, that's local to us, it, it's worth having a look at their, their stuff. So purpose gives direction through rapid, rapid change. Companies here going through rapid change? Painful? Yeah, so purpose can, can help drive, drive you through that rapid change. It can generate the momentum to get through those growing pains and those challenges. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some, some examples of um, what a purpose is. So pur purpose statements have to have some criteria, I think. This is Facebook's. Um, it needs to communicate. I think this was in, in the manifesto that they launched a, a, a few weeks ago, if anybody saw that. Um, Purpose should, should communicate something about what makes your business unique. So lots of statements include words like teamwork and innovation and integrity and leadership and, and so forth. But they're, they're so commonly used, they kind of lose some meaning, don't they? Now, whether you like Facebook or not, you have to agree that there aren't, there aren't very many organizations that could aspire to do that. Anybody want to hazard a guess at what this one is? Any thoughts? Tax collectors? Yeah, we make sure that the money is available to fund the UK's public services. Now, I think that's really powerful. Is that you? If any of you were, were in, worked for HMRC, I presume there are no HMRC employees in here, but if anybody was from HMRC and you came to this event this morning and somebody went up to you and said, Hi, my name's Peter. What do you do? And you said, I help, I help to make sure that your kids can go to school, or I help to make sure that if you get run over, you get treatment in A&E, hopefully. That's much more powerful than saying, I help to collect taxes on behalf of the government, isn't it? I think that's pretty inspirational. Um, purpose statements need to combine the emotional and the rational. Again, whether you think BT are actually capable or eligible to make that statement is not the point. Um, the House say, and this is from one of, one of Steve Fuller's blogs, the House say an, a, 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 a purpose statement should make you feel like you're at the top of the ski run. That little bit of, I mean, I'm not a skier, so I, I don't really know, but I have done mountain walking and I have been very close to the edge of large valleys and looked at huge mountain peaks that I'm trying to walk up. And you get that feeling of, can we really actually do this? Past, a, a purpose statement should, should carry that level of emotion and challenge. Um, they should be easy to understand. And this one from Kellogg's is, is in really good plain language, I think. Um, simple to the point, clearly oriented to, what, to, to the needs of their customers and, um, and what they actually do. Um, here's another one that I really like, which, uh, which exists to make individuals as powerful as the organisations they deal with in their daily lives. Now, if you want to inspire your employees, you give them something that's tangible and pragmatic in their, power state, in, in their purpose statement, but also inspiring. So if you're an employee working for, for which, you're an individual who one day might want to be as powerful as the organisation that's trying to take advantage of them. So I think, I think that's really good. Um, and here's the one that illustrates, really for me, why purpose statement is different from mission. So NASA will have lots and lots and lots of missions, Mars or Saturn or whatever it is. 
Um, but their purpose is to boldly go, no, their purpose is to reach for new heights and reveal the unknown for the benefit of humankind, which is the same as to boldly go, really, isn't it? So purpose is never ending. Um, for NASA, each mission supports their core purpose, but their core purpose is never achieved. So here's ours. Um, it's a distillation of our mission statement, which you saw at the beginning of this. Um, captures what we aspire to do in relatively plain language. Um, certainly inspires us. Um, and it's never ending because there's always room for both us and our, and our clients to, to improve. So we, we quite like this. I'm happy to have some feedback from you guys. And I, I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, so if you want to write a purpose statement, it doesn't just come from thin air, does it? Um, so Steve Jobs says you can't connect the dots by looking forward. Um, Steve Fuller, <coughs> another Steve of the house, um, in, a, in a blog called How to Write an Inspirational Purpose, says this. He says it's about digging into your heritage, seeking customer and employee insight, undertaking SWOT analysis and researching trends. By looking back into the past, getting a clear, clear view of the present and studying future trends, excuse me, you can ensure that your purpose statement has purchase in the real world. So this is not a, this is not a simple thing that, that, that you're, you're going to be doing. And purpose <clears throat> also has two levels too. It's, it's about the business, but it's also about the individuals in the business. So this is a model of employee engagement developed by Blessing White. Um, it's called the X model of engagement. Uh, I quite like this. Um, not because I want to talk to you about employee engagement today, but because <clears throat> the, the blue uh, bit of the X is the journey that the company is on towards its goals, and the green or brown or whatever bit of the X is the journey that the individual is on towards achieving their goals. And the bit in the middle is when that individual is either employed by or, or working with um, or owning the, the, the business. And the bit at the top, the <clears throat> It's actually uh, two people with a big star behind them. I'm not sure that you can see that, but um, that's when the individual is getting maximum satisfaction in achieving their goals and delivering maximum contribution to the business. Now, if you if you read Blessing White stuff, there's lots of ways that you can you can maximise employee engagement. But to me, having a purpose in the business that resonates with the purpose of the individual is probably the best way of achieving that. Would you agree? Yeah. Okay, so this quote I heard on QI, which normally is an accurate and, and, and um, uh, reliable source of stuff like this when Stephen Fry um, makes a statement. But he, but I, I, I went and did, a, did some research to, to actually find out where exactly Mark Twain said this. And I came across a website that said, Mark Twain has been attributed with hundreds and hundreds of different statements that he never said. So whether it's Mark Twain or not, I don't know. But it is, I think, quite a good um, quote. The two most important days in your life, the day you were born, and the day you find out why. So I want, with the few minutes that I've got left, just to talk about why I do what I do, and then tie everything up afterwards. Is that OK? So I was brought up um, the eldest of five four boys and a girl. Uh, and being the eldest, my parents always expected me to show an example and to take responsibility of my younger siblings. Um, my sister, I was probably the closest with my sister. She's seven years younger than me. Um, and I remember when, before she could speak, um, she used to call me big. And I used to come home from school and she'd be crawling towards me or running towards me shouting, Big, big's home. When I left primary school and went to um, secondary school, my parents bought me a fountain pen. Um, my sister bought me some blotting paper for my birthday. Now, I lost the fountain pen, but I still got the blotting paper. It's in my loft, secreted away. And I don't think I've ever used it. It's still got happy birthday written on it. Um, when she was about 13, um, she got diagnosed with cancer on the back of her neck. Um, wasn't malignant, but no cancer is good, is it? Um, 
and she went through two years of in and out of hospital, um, some quite serious operations. I remember visiting her in London. Um, and she was in one of those beds where she was just kind of tied to everything to keep her still. Um, and she'd had an operation to graft some bone from her, I think her thigh or her shin to across two vertebrae to keep her neck straight. And um, it was written up in The Lancet because it was quite unusual at the time or quite specific at the time. Um, but she fought through it. I mean, she was the youngest of, youngest of five with four older brothers, so she was pretty robust and tough by then. Um, and she fought through it. And I remember when she came home, um, I helped to redecorate her bedroom. I gave her my record player and I bought her a copy of the Pretenders album, 1979. Anybody remember the Pretenders? She's still got it. I was with her for... Uh, a weekend a few months ago, and she dragged it out of the cupboard and played it. I couldn't believe that she still had it after all this time. Just goes to show that vinyl does last. Um, but I realized that all through my, my subsequent working career, I've kind of found people to look after. Um, I, I was in, a, I remember when I, I think in the mid 90s, I was made um, head of IT development, software development in an insurance company. We had a team of about 50. Uh, and in the first two weeks, I had a one to one with every single member of the team. One of the questions I asked them was, um, What is it you want to do? And to my astonishment, a lot of them said, I've never been asked that question before. And I, I could not understand how it was that the previous management had never thought about the development of these people. So that had quite a cathartic and uh, a effect across the, across the team. But I also brought, because um, IT was, had, a, had a pretty bad reputation in this company, I, also, I brought some people in from the business. Uh, partially that was to build a better relationship with the business, but also the people I picked were people that I thought had some real potential. And they were in customer services in various roles and I didn't think that they could achieve that potential in those roles. Um, so I, I brought them across. One of them, when I left that company, I then poached to another company and then again. Um, and he's just, uh, I was in touch with him recently, he spent the last nine years in Hong Kong as a regional director for Prudential. And it's just been extraordinary to me that, and, and really satisfying to me, that he's had such an extraordinary career. And I like to think that I played a bit of a part in that. When I was researching my why, um, I spoke to my wife and, and asked her, so did, did, did I collect people when I, when I was, when I was uh, working? She said yes and listed out the name of half, half a dozen people that I'd, I'd, I'd talked to her about at some point during my work, that, that people that I'd you know, put, put my arm around really and, and wanted to look after. And today I'm like that with my clients. I take it really personally if one of my clients gets let down, even by a member of their staff, let alone by, by a customer. I want to reassure them. I want to build their confidence in, in, in what they do and how they do it. Um, and I get no greater satisfaction than when I see uh, a business or an owner of a business, a client, feeling that they've got a bit more control over what it is that they're doing. I, I had an email recently from, from one of my clients, their vets, um, and I've been working with him now for a probably a couple of years on trying to help him build his reputation as an expert in sheep and goat dairy. The esoteric, but nevertheless. He emailed me to say that he'd just been invited to speak at, at a global sheep and goat dairy symposium in the excellent stream. I thought, wow, that's fantastic. He just run, this company's just run last two months ago, their second annual sheep and goat dairy conference to which they attracted an international roster of speakers and over 120 delegates. And for next year's conference, they're looking for a bigger venue because they're now, they're, they're now recognized with, with the expertise, with, with this expertise. And I think that's just fantastic. That's why I do what I do, because I can help people get to that level to be the best that they can be. So this purpose statement, it's not just High Growth Knowledge Company's purpose statement, it's mine as well. And it also happens to be my business partners, but for, for different reasons. <laughs> for, different, for completely different reasons. So there's some real power in this. We are, we're aligned behind our purpose because it has some deep resonance for us as individuals that goes way back into the past. My story starts, you know, when I was 
10 or 11, actually 7 when my, daughter, my, my sister was born. But, and I, I'm sure for, for each of you, that, that will be a similar, it will be a similar um, experience. You have to reach quite a long way back to find why it is that you're doing what you do today. And what you might find, when, when, when we've done this with clients, sometimes we find that actually what, what they really want to do isn't what they're doing today, it's something else completely. Uh, but it helps you understand what it is that you want to do. So my, uh, my, my pension advisor, I was telling Nick this the other day, I think uh, my pension advisor is always asking me when I'm going to retire. And I am old, but, um, but I say to him, I don't know. Why would I want to retire? Because I do what, what I do, I love doing. It feels to me that this is my purpose. This is what I was meant to be doing here. So I think as long as I can add value, I'm, I'm always going to do what I do. That's the power of purpose right there. So that's that. I think I've overrun a little bit, but not much. Um, so we've got time for questions. If anybody's got any questions, or I'm around afterwards, or if anybody wants to have a browse through these books, that's, that's all I've got to say this morning. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>